Last time I picked uh, Jababa as a player uh, to model, who I thought of as a 21st century player, and you know, he's a very extreme version, I would say. Uh, this time I decided to choose Hikaru, uh, who I would say is, well, you know, probably a little bit stronger than Jababa, but also, you know, he, he kind of, his style is naturally very, very aggressive. He tends to take lots of risks. And I don't know, I mean, I, I'd say that his, his style is kind of hard to define, like most of the top guys are, but I would say that he's definitely okay playing, you know, with lots of risks, not even necessarily playing always the best moves, but he's very good at certain things. Like, he's very good at uh, presenting problems for his opponents to solve. Um, he's very resourceful. And he also is very opportunistic. So if you give him any sort of chance to take advantage of something, uh, he'll almost always be ready to jump on it. And um, that's one of the things I wanted to focus on, yeah? So this position is kind of weird. Like, I, I'm not exactly sure how to evaluate it. What do you guys think? I don't think this is an example of a bad position. But as I said, I think it's actually very difficult to evaluate this position. Um, tell me why. You know, white might try to play on the king side, but then the queen side might become weak. These are things that are true. Um, but OK, I think the important things are black's king. That definitely matters. Why, what is wrong with black's king? What do you mean? G6 and H5 are still there, as far as I know. True. If the pawn were back on H7, I would like black's position more. I think we could all agree with that, right? Uh, black's a little overextended there. Um, so that king is always going to be a little bit open. But why is black not just busted? Usually, if your king's open in a Sicilian, your position's horrible, right? What is what does black have in his favor? The knight on e5. In general, in Sicilians, if black can secure a piece so well on the e5 square, uh, usually a knight, uh, it's very problematic because the knight there not only defends the king side, which is a little bit weak, but it also controls all the important squares. It hits the bishop on d3, so if you ever want to get rid of that bishop, you can. It threatens knight c4. It holds a lot of crucial squares. Um, and it just basically makes it so that it's really difficult for white to do anything with that knight there. Um, and I think because of this, the position may even be roughly balanced. But OK, as one of the things I've noted is that with Hikaru, he doesn't always care whether he's better or not. Now, sometimes this can be dis like not an advantage. He can sometimes you know, play into positions which aren't so great for him and get punished. But a lot of the times, I think it actually helps him out because he's far less restricted. He's not bound so much by trying to find always the absolute best moves. He's just, you know, he wants a kind of complicated position. He likes complicated positions. But he's also, you know, he, he doesn't always care whether he's better or not. He just wants to play moves and, you know, create problems for his opponents. So how can white improve his position? Uh, for those of you who have not seen the game. For those of you who have seen it, I think you can come up with something. All right, so how can white improve the position? I'm not asking for a, a huge sacrifice or for some dramatic move. Small improvement. I can either knight d2 or knight e2 because I want to start to transfer my pieces over to the king side. I think that's a very good idea. Um, the question is, which knight do you start with? And I, and I honestly think that it, it could very well be that both moves are OK. Uh, he ended up starting with knight e2. The reason I like this move is because in the beginning of the game, this knight makes perfect sense, right? You're controlling the central squares. You're controlling the e4 pawn. But now, this pawn's defended way more than enough times, right? You got three defenders and one attacker. This pawn does not need to be defended by that knight. But this knight is also restricted, right? It can't move here. It can't move here. So this knight often ends up being kind of misplaced later in the game in a Sicilian. So usually, you move it there early because it looks nice. And this happens to lots of pieces in lots of openings, where at first you put a piece on a really good square. But as the game progresses, your opponent controls the squares it can move to. It becomes not such a good square. You have to fix it. So he played knight e2. So where is that knight headed, most likely? Very good. All right. 
So black played rook e8. He doesn't want to give up his pawn on e6. White continues with the plan. So he wasn't really worried about knight takes d3 moves, mainly because it gives up all the defense of the king side. So what do you think black should play here? Yep. Bishop h6 because the knight to the queen. It's an excellent move. Um, pins the knight to the queen. OK, the queen can move to g3, for instance. Um, and then you have to calculate lines like bishop takes f4, queen, knight takes d3 and e5, but maybe your king's too open. Probably is. So maybe you just play a move like, you, you still have to be careful. Like, what do you play after um, queen g3? King h7 is possible, but you have to calculate sacrifices like taking on g6, right? I don't think it works. But yeah, king h7 looks reasonable. I also am not convinced this is so bad, because you can take, take, ah, I guess maybe there's this move. That, that is probably, oh no, wait, of course. <laughs> Whoops. Good thing I wasn't playing this game. But pawn takes knight, e5, queen h6, and now you're not obligated to take the bishop. You can move back. And actually, this position might be pretty good for black, because here, this knight is really awkward. Queen can come into c2. Probably not so bad. But OK, black's, white doesn't have to play queen g3. For example, rook f1 is probably a reasonable move. Um, but the point is, black's totally in the game. It's just a normal position. Uh, instead, black decided that his queen was out of play on the queen side, and he wanted to bring it to the king side. Play this move. So for those of you who have not seen the game, what are white's options? Well, what moves do you look at first, every position? Well, what tempo moves are possible? Just list them. Knight takes e6, knight takes h5. Any of those? Queen g3 is a tempo move. Taking on e5, of course. Oh, okay. So, any of those look promising? Yeah. Knight takes g6. Obviously. OK. So believe it or not, black resigned here. Question is, why did black? Now, resignation was a little premature. But he did, you know, it is a losing position, most likely. The question is why? Why does this work? It looks like black, the position was normal just a move ago, right? Black can play bishop h6, it would be totally normal. And this is actually one of the reasons why bishop h6 was a good move, because you prevent this move. Well, since I take e6, and this is a serious problem. Because the knight's pinned and it doesn't have a good defense. If king f7, rook f1 is a little bit more precise. The king has nowhere to run to guard this knight. If king here, incidentally, you probably are going to play check. It's not mate, the knight can block. But you can take here, take the queen. You can do lots of wonderful things. Now, for someone who is not under the age of 16, what is the move here? Thank you. E5, the bishop pins the knight, and there's no way to defend it. The knight can take, but you simply take this knight, and notice, again, the pin is just too much. So it seems like kind of a sudden end to a normal game, right? But I think that, and OK, black clearly blundered. Black was a pretty strong GM. I mean, it's not like he normally would make a mistake like this. But one of the things that Hikaru is very good at is he knows kind of how to put pressure, and he's always looking for traps. Now, he didn't play for just a trick. He didn't you know, put some piece on a weird square just to play for one little trick. He improved the piece, right? But he improved the piece knowing that this trick was there. And he's very good at pouncing on opportunities when his opponents don't quite see what he's up to. So yes, knight e2 to f4 is just a nice improvement for the knight. There was no real mystery, right? It looked like just normal moves. but. Knight takes g6 was a definite problem. And it wasn't one that black uh, spotted in time.
Again, having to resign after one move is kind of sad, but the way it goes. All right, uh, so the next one. So yeah, this was his next, um, this was another game of his from the Olympiad. So in the opening, he actually had a lot less space than his opponent, but he snagged the two bishops. So it's kind of a common, you know, I would almost say, what openings does this look like for reverse colors almost? What's structure? Always looking for the structures, right? Remember how, for those of you who are here for the previous lecture, the Bononi structure? I'm always looking for the structure. Maraxi bind is with e4, c4 pawns against pawn on d6, usually. This is like a French. Okay. Imagine if black has a pawn here. It's like a French with colors reversed. And you'll notice this, like when GMs talk about positions, um, like we're always looking, what structure is this? What opening is this? Because it usually tells us where our pieces belong and what's going on. Um, it's a little different because white has a dark square bishop and black does not. I'd say this is a very important feature. Uh, despite the fact that black has extra piece, I would probably not want to be black here for the main reason that I don't like not having my bishop in a position where my pawns usually want to go on light squares, right? I do not want pawns on light squares and not to have a dark square bishop in general. So I would already prefer white, but it's nothing serious. He played a5 to try to discourage expansion over here, but Akaro plays patiently. Bishop here. You can tell he has his eye on this, but okay. Most, most GMs will not allow you to checkmate them on g7, at least not right away. Keeps pieces out of g4. So for example, after a move like this, he didn't want to have to deal with this bishop trade because he wants to keep his two bishops. And you'll notice this is true in most situations. If you have two bishops, it's nice to keep your two bishops. Even a trade of bishops makes it so that your life is a little bit more tricky. So he didn't want that. d5, a4. So this part of the game I'm going to go through a little quicker. b6. Notice how normally you wouldn't want to create this weak square in a position like this, right? But why is this now not such a bad option? What feature in the position allows this to be OK? Right. The, the main feature is that because white has this bishop and black does not, black, white doesn't have to worry so much about the dark squares becoming weak, right? Because white's the one with the dark square bishop. And that's why he can get away with this kind of thing. Um, and notice how this bishop becomes very active on the a3 square. Yes, the bishop would be nice if this ever opened, but do you think it's going to happen anytime soon? I don't think so. So he wants to activate his bishop this way. So this happens. He activates his bishop, finishes his development. He maneuvers his knight to g3, which actually I'm not so sure about, but my guess would be that he didn't want to get attacked over here, maybe? Because the, it looks like the queen side's where the action's happening. So I was a little surprised by this move. Um, but OK. He decides to put his knight on g3, castles. Brings his rook. He's not really worried about h4, because the knight can always come back. And now he builds his position. And now, this is the part of the game where I'd really like to start. Because he plays rook c2, preparing just to double rooks, and then eventually try to take over the c file. And black decides to mix up the game with b5. Now, if it were me, I would probably not want to deal with this. I probably would have played queen d2 on my last move. Why would I want my opponent to be able to play b5? One of the features of Ikaru's game is that he does not mind his opponent com complicated the game. Even if he's better, he often just likes complications. He almost wants to tempt his opponent to go into them because he's so confident he can calculate them better than his opponent. That isn't to say if he's totally winning, he's going to allow counterplay every time. That would make him not such a strong chess player. <laughs> Uh, and he's a very strong chess player. The key is that he will, doesn't mind allowing complications as long as he thinks they're decent for him. And he also you know, thinks he has them covered better than his opponent does. Because b5 could be a really nasty move if you don't expect it, right? All of a sudden, if the pawn lands on b4, your bishop's not as good. Um, you know, It might grab the c file for black if you're not ready to, to deal with it. So the question is, how does he deal with this move? 
So let's use process of elimination uh, a little bit. What move do we not want to allow under any circumstances? So how can we prevent B4? That's possible, but that would also give up C4, right? So let's find a less drastic solution to our problems. Bishop d6 is possible, but the bishop doesn't have that many squares, right? So I would be a little bit nervous. Not to mention that you have to watch out for, for example, b takes c, b takes c, knight b6, right? Attacking the bishop, the knight might head to c4. I, I don't think that's something you want to allow, probably. Does that make sense? Yeah. Remember, it's Akaro, right? He likes to solve his problems tactically. And in this case, there's a very good reason to solve them tactically. So. C takes I like. I do not like giving up that bishop. Uh, especially I don't like allowing b4 and then trades this guy and then this guy's loose. I'd say that's not what he wants to do. But he simply goes back. I know, this is kind of a letdown after such a pause, right? But what's the idea of this? Right. Yeah. There's a pin on the bishop. It's that simple. <coughs> and he thinks that b5, while an active move, also created weaknesses. Now this is weak, now this is weak, there's a pin. So he thought that he actually was provoking his opponent a little bit to play b5 in order to give himself weaknesses. This is something else I've noticed he likes to do. Uh, more so than a lot of chess players, he likes to provoke his opponent into advancing or into making things complicated a little bit. Um, and in this case, I mean, he kind of has a point because those two pawns look very weak. So black took and played queen b8, trying to defend. White played this move. So again, being tricky, right? Because this bishop is not defended, he can try to attack this pawn. And it's kind of an annoying thing. Um, So in this position, black played h4, which I actually think is a poor move, because after h4, knight f1, I think the knight's improved a little bit. Oops. This was the move I expected. And here, black white actually could do something which is quite good. So force you take, bishop takes. So the question is, what's the idea here? So taking on a5 runs into what? Followed by? Do you want to trade all the pawns? No. Because it makes it more drawish, right? So? Does anyone remember the rule I gave you at the beginning of this game? Regarding bishops? Oh, bishop. Oh, keep the bishop here. Yes. When you have a bishop pair, you want to keep it. Bishop d1 looks like kind of a silly move, right? You're, you're putting your bishop on a, like a weird square to avoid the trade. But sometimes moves like this are actually very strong, and I think that's the case here. Because now, not only are you avoiding the bishop trade, that's only part of it. Part of the deal is that now you're defending your one weakness on the queen side. But what, what pawn will be much tougher to defend for black? a5. a5 is going to be extremely weak here. The bishop can maybe maneuver via b2 and c3. The knight can come back via e2 and go either to f4 or to c3. Basically, black's going to be tied to defending this a-pawn, and life is not going to be so pleasant. Um, so bishop d1 would have been a really nice move. And again, I think he would have spotted it. But um, but yeah, it's basically it, it really illustrates the point that when you have just one side of the board where there are weaknesses, you want to make sure that your weaknesses are defended while you can attack your opponents. And avoiding the bishop trade really does that. Because note how this bishop, okay, it can go here, but it doesn't really do anything there. And it can't really attack this pawn, right? This pawn can't be attacked by this bishop. So, so h4 was played instead, and then rook e6. But now he can grab this pawn uh, quite safely. Um, 
So, pawn takes pawn. Bishop takes queen a8. This was the defense that Audubon was relying on. And I actually know him. I, I played him um, at this tournament in the Netherlands. We analyzed a bunch. Tactically, the guy is uh, very, very strong. And this was back when he was, say, uh, lower rated GM. Now the guy is, you know, approaching 2,700. He's probably going to be uh, an elite GM at some point. Uh, but tactically, he calculates very fast and very accurately. Um, but when you are you have one guy who's approaching 2,600 playing a guy, or sorry, approaching 2,700, compared to a guy who's approaching 2,800, there's still a level gap. Um, and while uh, Audubon calculates extremely well, I still wouldn't take him over Hikaru in that department. Um, and my guess would be that Hikaru simply outcalculated him in this position. But the key is, what did Hikaru see that maybe Audubon missed? Because this was clearly Black's defense. This was the idea, to be able to pin this bishop and win it, uh, if queen takes a4, rook takes a6, the game becomes very messy, right? Even though you're up a pawn, you have a pinned bishop. Life is not so pleasant. So what was Hikaru's idea? Uh, and also keep in mind that during the game, you have to see this quite a ways in advance because all these moves were pretty forceful. Well... Let's make this easier. Black thread is what? With, with the rook, right? Yeah. Prevent this move. What? Well, it was a good thought. This move is possible, but after takes, here, a3, black kind of hangs on. Uh, it's not over yet, because this pawn is actually slightly annoying, you've given up your light squared bishop, it's not so easy. This move is very clever because now um, if rook takes bishop, you just take on a4 and you're up a very, very clean pawn because you control all the queenside squares. If you allow rook takes a6, then black controls the a-file, it becomes much more complicated. So quite a move, right? Hanging one bishop to save the other. Um, but black decided to take this pawn instead. And this is a very, very common idea when a side is, thinks they're losing. He could have taken on d6 and allowed Hikaru to take on a4 and then just be a clean pawn up. But he thought, okay, I'm, Hikaru's technique's good enough, he's just going to beat me. So what I want to do is I want to make a slight mess of the game. I want to keep the game complicated to give Black a chance to uh, let me back in it. So, what now? Keep in mind that now white's under more pressure, right? right? If white doesn't win any material here and allows the bishop to get taken back, you're not going to be up anything. So white has to be very precise. It's a good start. He played a3. Um, I think the moves are actually equivalent. Uh, I think the purpose of queen a3, though, is to make it so this bishop can move. After queen b4, this bishop can't move. So maybe a move like knight e8 would be possible. Not totally sure, but I think that queen a3 makes it a little bit nicer. But okay, b2. Also now the rook does have the option of moving. So It's usually good to find squares which defend all your guys. The queen here... Just defends this, this, this. Well, if rook b1, what's the problem that white has now? The queen's a bit overloaded, and also these bishops can't move, right? Yes. This one certainly can. Maybe this one? But you have a better move? So 
So the idea of bishop b5 is that because your queen on a8 hangs, you l allow me to get out, right? So what was your idea? Uh, can I still move my bishop? I assume that's a yes. This tongue sticking out usually means yes. So what else? Prevent this resource of bishop b5. Your very cautious tone is appreciated, but yes. Queen c6, if this bishop moves, this one hangs. So that's the skewer of death right there. A skewer and an x-ray. It's nice when tactics combine. They, they're very picturesque. Anyway, it's very depressing for white because one of the bishops has to fall. And with that, probably the advantage. And that's why Hikaru took on b2. But think about this. Not only... To give you an idea of the level that these guys are at, not only do the, all these moves have to be correct now, because this whole sequence is forced, he was probably thinking about this over five moves ago. So five moves back or maybe more, he had to think about this whole sequence before he went down it. Now, it doesn't mean he, didn't, he calculated it with no errors, but it means that those are the kind of calculations you have to make. And both these guys are extremely strong calculators, so they can actually do this. But even guys like this can make mistakes. And often what it means is one guy sees a little bit more accurately or one move deeper, and that makes the whole difference in the line. And these are the kind of battles that Hikaru likes because he tends to win them because he calculates so well. So he takes on b2. Rook takes d6. But black has even material. How is, what, how is white supposed to win? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Bishop a6, I can play rook b6. Bishop c6, I can play knight takes. No, I can't. After bishop c6, rook takes, rook takes, rook c8. Keep in mind also that even if I sack a queen for a rook and a piece, it's not entirely clear you're going to win. You probably will, but it's not totally sure, right? Bishop c8 is very cute, but the problem is I can move my knight then. Or play rook b6. Yeah. Sometimes you, you can't win a piece, you know? Sometimes all you can win is a pawn. And it's funny because he gave up a pawn to win this pawn. But this is a very, very important pawn. Because now e4 is really weak. Not to mention that I would say black's king is not ideal. But okay, he's still not done yet. Rook b6. And the knight comes to d2, he's safe. Notice how if black had not played h4 with the knight on g3, black might have had more chances to do something here. But because he played a move forcing the knight to a better square, it, it's hard to believe that f1 will be better than g3. But the knight on d2 is actually a pretty good piece. Um, so you can get why I was a little confused why Akaro put it on g3 in the first place, but uh, it's a little too deep for me. So. Uh, bishop to b3, and then here he was able to win pretty smoothly. Um, so black played king g7. So the key to a position like this is, okay, you're up a pawn. You probably should be winning because black also have, has weaknesses. The f7 pawn's kind of weak. The e4 pawn, white's pieces are a little better. The key is to make sure you always are maximizing your pressure and not giving it up. For example, if you have an attack or you have a lot of pressure involving the queens, you don't really want to trade them, even though trading queens often you know, will give you an end game, which usually you want to trade pieces when you're ahead, right? But if you have an attack or you have pressure, you don't want to give up one of your good pieces for your opponent's bad pieces. So I think in this game, he used a pretty good combination of you know, keeping up the pressure while not allowing counterplay. Even someone who likes complications like Ikaro does, he's not going to allow some you know, insanity for the most part when he's just winning. Uh, and in this position, rather than being better, he's probably just winning. So he doesn't want to allow too much. So, uh, and again, these positions, there are lots of different moves. 
Uh, he plays queen c3. He doesn't want to be in a pin for longer than he has to. Queen d7. Brings his knight into the game. All pretty logical, right? Rook to c6. He pins himself. Although in this case, that bishop's pretty well defended. Um, and okay, next move, he can think about playing queen a5 or queen b3 and trying to attack stuff. So the knight got off the back rank. Rook a7. So notice how he's kind of just improving and taking his time. Um, so the rook on a7 is just a slight improvement. Pins the knight. Uh, there's some pressure along that, that uh, the seventh rank. Just kind of an annoying thing. So black played rook b6. White played rook bishop b3. Again, very, very small improvements. But now the queen can maybe move to c7. The bishop might go to c2 to attack the pawn. The rook on b6 can no longer come into the game. Just small improvements to the position. Black played queen d6. So. What to do? And keep in mind, there might not be more than one good move here. So what's the tempting move? Knight c4. Knight c4. But what's the problem? Rook c6. Maybe, well, rook c6, I'll take on d6 and take on f7, maybe? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it works. Uh, If knight c4, yeah, if rook c6, I think this works out. You'll find that when your position is good, tactics tend to be in your favor. I don't believe this works. I could play knight e8 check, but I think even meaner is this one. And then rook takes. Actually, I don't know if I'd take this, because now... <laughs> oh, that was a little bit of a loud whistle there. And now there's mate threats and okay. So probably you should play knight e check after all. Uh, if uh, king takes? Yeah, after, after knight e8, the same idea. Yeah. And then this box. So again, tactics tend to work in your favor. But here I think that black has, a, has maybe queen b4 as an option. Which might be more annoying. There's also queen c6, but then d5 might be... Uh, might be quite strong. Again, he wants to keep things kind of simple, right? So he plays queen c4. This pawn should probably be defended. He plays queen f8. And now? What happens if knight takes e4? Because you always want to be on the lookout for tactics, right? Curious thing, huh? Could be rook b4 is the answer. Yeah, I thought rook b4 was queen b8. Because now you're tied to this. If queen, uh, queen c2 and queen b8. This could be. Because now the problem is that rook takes here and you're threatening mate. So remember that these guys are, these guys are both very, very strong tactically. So they're always looking for traps. That's a pretty nasty trap, wouldn't you say? So you always have to be very careful. You know, your opponent looks like you have an easy way to win. Make sure you check the tactics and all the forcing lines. Knight takes e4. You can see that rook b4 is a tempo move. You have to calculate it. Queen b8, also a tempo move because it attacks like everything. And potentially threatens mate. So you have to be very, very cautious. And that's why, almost for sure, white played rook to c7. Um, just sort of improving his rook. Maybe threatening rook c8. Black played rook b4. White moved the queen to a6. So just kind of keeping black's queen from coming to d6, from improving itself. So black played back. White played queen back. Um, so my guess would be that he was trying to gain a little time. And by the way, 
if you if for example let's say he played queen to a6 and this is a good lesson regardless of whether you're winning or losing if after rook back you decide wait a second i don't want my queen there i'm gonna go back there's nothing wrong with that don't do it again because it means that you'll have a lot of perpetual and then you have to be depressed knowing you drew a one game but repeating the position once is something gms do all the time and we do it often on purpose. First of all, it actually can mess with the head of some people. Because they're like, oh, why, why is my opponent going back and forth? Do I want to draw? What's going on? And meanwhile, we're just thinking about what we're going to do next. So repeating doesn't mean you're going to repeat more than once. So repeating once is totally fine. And oftentimes, and actually it happened here, repeating once makes your opponent second guess themselves or feel like they should improve their position. And oftentimes they play a bad move to avoid the repetition. Audubon could have gone back, but he was like, but then White will just play queen c3, for example, and improve his pieces, and I wouldn't have accomplished anything. I'm going to try to punish him for going back, and I'll play this move. However, what's the problem? Now it works. So he took, um, and the problem is knight takes f2 fails. Well, which one? Queen takes. Queen takes is actually very important. Because if you take with the rook, and this, would, by the way, was almost certainly Audubon's his idea. And now you're kind of a little embarrassed. Now, maybe it's still winning after a move like g4, but do you want to allow crazy complications like this when you're totally won? I don't think so. But you take with queen, and that ends the debate. Because now... The king can't just move away, because this will hang with check, so you have to take. <laughs> and now the knight will hang. So there will be no checkmate without that knight. And definitely don't allow a knight into here. <laughs> um, so notice how, you know, he's, these guys are always looking for tricks and, to, and, and trying to, you know, improve their positions, but you also have to be on the lookout for tactic and the details all the time. So it's very important that queen takes f7 is available. He played king h6 instead, which is kind of tricky. But now, he just plays here, which is a nice move, because now knight takes f2 fails to what? Yeah. yeah. And from here on, it was pretty simple. Played knight g5. Incidentally, any chance you have to tie your opponent up usually makes the win very easy. And it also makes it easier on you, right? Because if your opponent has almost no moves, you, you, there, are, there are fewer chances you're going to miss something. If you give your opponent lots of options, maybe one of them will be good, right? So it's funny. There are, there are some positions where you want to give your opponent options because they can mess it up. But often when you have a one position, you want to give your opponent very few options. Queen here is a very nasty move because it hits this pawn, hits this guy, and just ties black up completely. So he played here. He grabbed another pawn because why not? Queen here. And then, okay, there are many moves to win. He chose kind of a nice move, which is this one. The idea being that now, if the queen takes the bishop, you have mate. If queen b1, you also have mate. So he has to trade. But this, this end game is not salvageable. And he just resigns. <laughs> Three pawns against the super GM is usually too much. Um, so that was that as far as this game goes. Um, but note how, you know, okay, he, he got a slightly better position from the opening, at least in my opinion. Um, but the way he won was he kind of let his opponent, you know, come to him. He didn't actually feel the need to just rush after his opponent. He built his position a little bit. And the second his opponent initiated tactics with b5, he just said, well, I'm just going to out-calculate you. Um, he grabbed a pawn when he needed to. He calculated the long sequence very well. Um, but that was the main difference between them this game, that he simply calculated a little bit better and a little bit deeper.